it's one thing to know all the theory and all the important stuff and all like that and it's quite another to uh have to deal with the reality when you're feeling pressure so i'm a little bummed uh, i didn't play on stream yesterday uh, i decided you know what um i didn't really have the energy for a full grind but i figured i'd play another 22 dollar uh flight to get into the 100k guaranteed which is now i'm sure well over 200k uh double deuce and i've been trying to get into this thing all week um and i was doing really well yesterday and the idea the thing about this tournament is it's a day it's a two day so the idea is to get through the first day with a workable stack because basically you show up in the cash uh, but it's a second tournament, right? And, you know, so you play like four and a half hours or something like that, like, f you know, uh, the first day. And then the second day, you, you know, you play in the cash down to the winner. And top prize will be somewhere, it'll probably end up being somewhere around 26, maybe 30,000, somewhere in there. I think it was 26 when I saw it yesterday. So... You know, the closer you get to the actual event, being today, players play a little bit dumber. So the stupid thing that I didn't do was I didn't make a, make it a point to play it on Monday or Tuesday, which would have been a much more consistent way to get in, but would have been less chips available because of less people entering. But it might have been a lot less variance. So I didn't really start trying to get in until, I think, until Wednesday. And since then, I've played seven times where I spun in twice and then I bought in five times. Uh, that's including today when I bought in. And yesterday it was going pretty well. And I'm sitting there, you know, just kind of... I was kind of near the top the whole time till the blinds started going up. And then I was like 10th or 15th, or between 10th and 15th in chips. And had pocket eights in the small blind and a player who had been raising every hand and had I had three bet him a ton... Or, or he had been three bet a ton and folded, but I didn't get a chance to do it. He was directly to my right. And uh, he makes the same raise he's making on the button, uh, which was improper in the first place. His sizing was wrong. Um, so I had 30, like 28 or 30 blinds, something like that. And I had pocket eights in the small. He had 25 big blinds effective stack. And uh, I went with it and I jammed. And uh, I it's, it's one of those ones where it's like, I know the spot. This is what I'm supposed to do. And the idea is that you either win the pot or you take a race. And you, you're supposed to want to take the race in this scenario because if I win that pot, we were one level away from the end of the day. And that would have put me at uh, about 1.2 million, which going into the next day would have been about 50 blinds. My, my personal goal was a minimum of 30 blinds going into the second day, but I really wanted to have a million to feel comfortable. So I jammed, and of course the guy rolled over pocket jacks. And uh, it sucks, and I looked it up later, uh, if you want to double check me. Uh, check it out. <laughs> uh, so I'm kind of I'm dealing with all this emotional drudgery that I'm, I'm having lately. Um, tournament preflop charts my position is the small blind or blinds are 25 big blinds effective my position is the small blind uh, the action is versus a raise from the button and pocket eights is a hundred percent a jam you actually jam from sevens through nines pocket eights is perfectly in the middle I know this sucks it's actually any pair nines and lower you can jam there you can actually jam tens too but it's more profitable just to raise but uh, from the hundred percenters and the eights right in the middle and it just sucks because I ran the range that I'm supposed to be up against and uh, I'm 70 percent versus his opening range on the button so what are you gonna do um, so then I busted that one shortly after that which sucks and you kind of have to bust it because you can only enter the tournament twice. And I didn't want to show up with fucking 
three blinds on the second day, barely cashing. This is one of those ones where you don't want to crawl into the cash to just, you know, get your buy-in and, you know, a little bit more back. It's like you're trying to play for this big, you know, prize pool. And then, and then before I went to bed last night, so I played that and I did some work, you know, editing and stuff. And before I went to bed, I was like, you know what, let me look at, and see if there's any more flights left. Like, I've already played five of them this week. They've all kind of went bad. Uh, like, in three of them, I got aces in versus ace-king twice and ace-king, or pocket-kings the other time. Got all three of those aces cracked for monster stacks deep. Um, one of them I went set over set in, and then that one with the eights versus the jacks, which is just a cooler. So it's, you know, it's just super frustrating. So I looked at it, and the last flight was starting at 9 a.m. today. And I'm like, well, pfft, I'm never going to be up for it. But you know what? If I am awake, then fine. So I go to sleep uh, fairly early. I was kind of tired, uh, like 2.30 or 3 a.m., something like that. And uh, that's early for me. And I wake up, and I take the dogs to the dog park, and I look at my phone, and it's 8.45 in the morning. And I'm like, how the fuck is this possible? Like, I feel great. And I walk back inside, and I'm going to feed them, and I look at the microwave, and the microwave clock says 9.45. And I'm like, oh, shit. Well, I must have, it must have been the, the you know, the clocks went, went back. I just got an extra hour of sleep. That's perfect. So I got ready, felt good, and it was 9.15, and I was like, you know what? Let's do it. I'm in. And I got in the tournament. And uh, doubled up fairly quickly, went through, had about 400,000 chips uh, at one point with still like, it's still going, it's going to be going for another hour and a half. But then uh, I took a race with uh, pocket nines uh, versus a player with a starting stack, which is 20 blinds when I had like 70, lost that one. Then a player raised uh, on a 20 big blind stack. I three bet uh, with pocket sevens on the blind on the button. He was raising in the cutoff. Big blind jams all in uh, for 20 blinds. He folds. I call, of course. The guy has king queen, which is an amazingly stupid play. You would never see it in a normal tournament, but players are trying to build stacks, and if you're going to late reg with 20 blinds, you're going to gamble. And I lost that one. And... Uh, uh, then I played uh, another hand where uh, I had ace king and uh, three bet it. Guy calls. Uh, I make the ace. Uh, we get it all in. He has ace jack. Hits the jack on the turn. Great. Uh, and then the last hand, I still had like 30 blinds. And the guy in the big blind had like 28. And uh, this guy who was a bigger stack with like 40 blinds, he opens. Uh, and the cutoff, I'm on the button. I call it. Big blind calls. Flop comes off 10, queen, 4, or sorry, king, queen, 4. Checks to the original raiser. He c-bets small. I, of course, raise because I have the open ender. Big blind jams all in for 28 blinds, and it's like, well, he shouldn't have a lot here much, uh, so I'm probably just taking the race. I call. Uh, the other guy folds, and... Uh, the dude in the small blind rolls over 8-9. Uh, uh, so it's king, queen, 4, no flush draw. He has 8-9. Uh, and my jack-10 is actually ahead, and he can't hit a 9 because that makes me a straight. Anybody want to guess what the turn was? Yeah, he three-outed me. So that was really upsetting. And a uh, funny part was, I looked at my notes on the player, it was the king six guy. And if anybody remembers that hand, uh, that's the guy who had king six and put in 80% of his stack on the flop with a pair of sixes. And the king hit the turn and I had uh, aces. And he had put me on ace king, I guess. And uh, we got it all in on the turn. Uh, he hit a perfect turn card on me after putting 80% of his stack in on the flop from first position. Insane hand. So I was very upset. Uh, I'm still very upset. That only happened to me about 20 minutes ago. So uh, 
I know it doesn't matter. I know I've made the right decisions, but I am super bummed. Um, I'm just getting bled down, and I just keep ending up in these situations where I'm so far ahead, and I just keep, you know, I'm running bad. And it sucks because I'm running bad, but, like, to a small degree. It's one thing when you run bad and, like, you, you just, like, my aces got cracked five times today. You just kind of laugh about that. Like, you really don't give a shit. Like, no matter how deep I am in a tournament. Like, I've been on final table bubbles. I've been on cash bubbles and gotten it in preflop for 50 blinds with aces. And a guy rolls over, you know, like, pocket nines. Like, some ridiculous fucking hand that they just lost their mind with. And the guy makes a fucking, you know, set on you and you just go out. I laugh at those. Like, there's a moment of, ah, fuck. And then right after that, you're just laughing because of how stupid it is. But, but man, to just run bad enough to, like, do really well and then just take several beats in a row or lose several races and just only have an opportunity to just min-cash tournaments because you just get crippled late, it's just really uh, upsetting. So, uh, I'm kind of super bummed. Um, uh, and it's Sunday, and I want to play a bunch today, but, like, my mental state is all fucked up. So, um, I'm just going to go through some hands, then we'll do some Jonathan Little stuff. And uh, I'm going to look over the schedule and figure out when the best time to play is. I'm probably going to have to start late today, but that's fine. Uh, let's go ahead and... Uh, replay these this is from yesterday's play of the uh, satellite or not satellite but the day one uh, of that of that tournament that I've been talking about this is my fourth or fifth or my fifth buy-in in it uh, of the event not of this tournament I've only bought in one time each time so six individual times it's been crazy I've actually only bought in four times because I spun in twice but I played six of them this week and just couldn't make it through to day two. So we see a raise, and you can see I've doubled up early. Uh, you know, I have seven hundred. I have three quarters of a million. The average is four hundred eighty thousand. Like I'm just crushing at this point in the tournament, right? Um, I go ahead and call it. We go. We go three ways. Flop comes off four deuce deuce. Not really good for anybody. Uh, player bets does that quarter pot bet micro thing, which is stupid. So I float it. Uh, he's got a lot of chips too. Uh, turn comes off. He bets super small again. Again, this just doesn't mean anything. Uh, I double float it. Uh, river comes off. He bets super small again. This to me is an ace high or a shitty pair. Uh, so I just go ahead and bang it on the river and just, I didn't have to go crazy. Like I don't have to go full pot, but I just basically almost four X his bet. Uh, just because I was like, it's so easy for me to represent a full house or a flush here that you wouldn't bet crazy. Like you wouldn't bet 30 blinds here, you know, with, uh, you know, with a flush or full house, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, this is a bet you can make with a straight, uh, it's a bet you can make with trips, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it's also a bet you could make with that full house because you, you're very likely to get called by something. Uh, if, it, if the guy has a good hand now he raised preflop, he's never going to have a good hand here unless he has exactly ace deuce. And I think even that's a hard call. So uh, he folds. It was a nice move. And uh, yeah, that one popped me up to, to uh, about 850K. Uh, let's see here. Oh, where's the next one? Oh, I got to replay all the hands in the report. Really? I already thought I did that. Uh, let's see here. There's only three hands. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, man. All right. So we did that one. Let's go on to the next one. The queen jack offsuit. Uh, sitting at 54 blinds. Uh, this is much later, uh, but I'm still doing okay. I got like 650. And 50 blinds, man. You're doing pretty good. Uh, player raises on the button. I decide to just call it. Uh, flop comes off with a queen on it. Uh, this player, I check, this player bets super small. This is the opposite scenario where I feel like he's betting super small with nothing, so I just have it all. Uh, so even though it's only one pair, uh, I'm not really worried about him having a flush draw because this bet is just so nothing. So I just call it. Uh, turn comes off. I check. 
this player over bets 15.75 uh, blinds in the nine. And in game, I did this pretty damn quickly. Uh, I thought about, I let the time go for like three seconds and then just jammed all in on him. And he folded. And uh, this is just a good example where his, his flop bet told me he was weak. And his turn bet told me he was weaker. So, a nice hand, good time to recognize it. And you see I'm jamming all in. If he had called me, I'm out of the tournament. But uh, you have to make that move if you're going to make that play. Like, if I min-raise him, what does that say? Nothing. Queen deuce. Uh, I get called. I do decide to call it because uh, I need to make something happen. At this point, I had taken a beat with aces. Uh, and I'm at 540k. It's not bad, but I was at almost a million. I think after that last pot, I was over a million. Make a king or make a deuce. Player bets super micro again. This move is just bad. This isn't a thing that's coming around. The move is just bad. Uh, three on the turn. It goes check check. I of course bet the river. Uh, player folds. This is one where I'm betting like as a bluff and for value, like because the hands that can beat me fold here. Hands like you know queen ten, ace ten, you know hands like that or not ace ten, but maybe like ten nine. Um, hands like pocket sixes pocket sevens you know that might play this way if you played poorly those hands all beat me they're gonna fold uh but hands that i beat like ace high especially if somebody doesn't have the ace of hearts in their hands they're gonna call so i'm gonna get called here uh when i win and i'm gonna get the fold when i'm behind uh, a great majority of the time i think that's gonna be the outcome on this one is that when i'm called i win and when i'm and when I'm folded two, I was behind. I think that's the scenario about 80% of the time on runouts like this. Yeah, and that was that. That player, by the way, who raised the turn, uh, and I jammed on him on uh, this hand. Uh, this hand, where this guy jammed the turn for 15 blinds, overbetting the pot, and then I just jammed over the top of him. Uh, I wanted to see how many chips I had after that. Almost a million. Uh, the player, uh, this is the player who had the jacks later. Uh, he cracked aces and then he uh, got the jacks versus my eights. So, kind of shitty. Hey man, how's it going? No grind today? Yeah, the grind's coming, uh, I think, later today. But um, if you miss the start of the stream, you can watch it after uh, I go off. Uh, I'm kind of, I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start later today uh, because it's been a very... Uh, aggravating uh past 48 hours with poker um and and pretty much for a couple months now sorry i'm getting a text message here anyway um did i play last night yeah I, that, those were the hands from that tournament that I played last night. Uh, I just played one of those satellite, or not satellites, but the day ones into the uh, double deuce, the 100K. Um, and I played another one this morning. Um, didn't get in in either one of them, and it was just very upsetting the way I went out in both of them. Uh, perfect scenarios and just got dumbasses got lucky on me. What are you going to do? So, And that's been kind of upsetting and depressing because it's been the story of like my last month online which is really kind of upsetting me and it's like i i know all the the mental things and the mental toughness and i know all the reality of it is that if i play great you know eventually the money will come but the problem is i don't have eventually bankroll you know what i'm saying i have qui-gon broke bankroll so i'm i'm feeling very depressed uh, about it uh, if and I'm gonna play today, and it's gonna, but it's gonna take me some effort to uh, get my uh, mental state ready. So uh, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go through this uh, uh, some of the Jonathan Little stuff here, and uh, then I'm gonna try to get ready for the grind. Probably about three o'clock. I think what I want to do also is look at the tournaments after we go through this uh, section and uh, see what I want to play, and we'll do that together and. See if something gets me hyped up. Uh, but let's go on to this next section here. Let me uh, fix the sound so you guys can uh, hear everything going on. 
Yeah, I mean, I've, I've adjusted my uh, my buy-in level. Uh, my buy-in level is okay. Uh, the the twenty-two dollar investments, you know, into the day, into the two-day tournaments, uh, they're okay. The top end of my buy-ins is actually supposed to be somewhere around thirty-three dollars. Uh, the sixteen fifties are bigger buy-ins for me, though. Um, but I'm I'm following a very rigorous uh, bankroll management strategy. I still have. With that strategy, I still have uh, about 60 or I don't, I don't know exactly what it is, uh, 50 or 60 buy-ins. So, you know, I'm okay uh, as far as that goes. There's no there's no need to adjust yet. And here's the other thing. Uh, you do reach a critical floor where you can't play any lower. So if my average buy-in goes below eight bucks on average uh if that's the low end of it um i can't the investment of time will not pay off well enough will your staker reload for you uh, i don't have a staker uh i have uh my dad who uh helped me out or is helping me out with bills uh, but there's no real money for poker um so I guess if I said I needed it, maybe he'd give it to me, but uh, it's kind of not the goal. Like, if I go broke, then yeah. Like, uh, if I lose, you know, if, if I run it down doing proper bankroll management and uh, it runs down to nothing, then yeah, uh, I'll ask for some more money. But you know what it is? It's like, and one win recovers everything, right? My average wins are like $1,000. So one you know in in the in the tournaments i play in so one win you know it recovers everything and puts me well into the profit and you know kind of allows me to play a little bit bigger and you know that whole story but you know and here's the thing like when i'm studying this hard and i'm playing as much as i am and i'm improving as much as i am it's the natural human tendency to want to see a result more quickly um and i know how it goes like i've done this you know decades in my life i know how this goes i now have a stronger mental state and i'm a much more educated and well thought out player than i ever was so <laughs> i should be okay but you can only take so much if i had gone through this this kind of torturing downswing uh, a couple years ago um, I would have destroyed everything in my life like I, I really would like I would have just pissed the bankroll away I would have just said fuck it I, I wouldn't have cared I would have I would have felt like I was you know cursed or something like that I understand now that this is just the way that it goes and you know when you run hot everything's great um, and when you run normally you just kind of break even or lose a buy-in or two and that's been happening to me with a couple days intermixed of running poorly. Um, I mean, I'm still making the right percentage of final tables, but it's like getting sixth or fifth on a final table doesn't make up for all the, you know, volume you have to put in. So, uh, yeah, there's no staker. Uh, it, it sucks because I'm in a financial place where I can't afford to get staked because the money that they would invest in me, their their return on investment would be so much higher than the amount that I would lose uh, by giving up the stake. It's a horrible feeling when you're down swinging and you start questioning everything. That's the thing, though. Uh, my mental game is to the point where I'm not questioning my play. Uh, there's been a couple times where I've been like, you know, had head scratchers where I'm like, well, maybe I was wrong. Like yesterday, right? Like... That's the perfect scenario I was in. Pocket eights right there, especially versus that player. That's perfect. Uh, and I was like, I walked away from the computer. I literally like threw the headphones down, walked away from the computer, and like was walking through the hallway. And this back of my mind, my head went, should you really have jammed those pocket eights for 25 big blinds effective? And I stopped before I went to the kitchen where I was going to get a drink. And I turned around and I went back and I looked at the GTO charts and it was like, yes, 100%. I'm like, I know this. Like, I know this one. So, and then immediately I was able to like let it go. 
but I just kind of woke up feeling the weight of the last two months, you know? And, uh, you know, I could keep this shit to myself and, and not talk about it. Um, it, I'm not one of those people where it helps me to talk about it. It really doesn't because I need, I, I look for solutions to problems and, you know, like my wife, you know, she'll sit there and she'll talk to me about something going on or an issue she's having or a problem. And I used to like sit there and go, well, you could try this or maybe this would work or whatever like that. And eventually she had to explain to me when I tell you stuff like this, I'm not looking for a solution. So we made a deal. She's like, if I'm, if I'm looking for ways to solve a problem, she's like, I will say at the end of this, what do you think I can do? Uh, I don't work that way. Um, think it's better to getting things off your chest. Um, uh, yeah, I agree with that on some level, but I am, you know, I, all right, this, this is weird, but I, I have, you know, uh, different parts. How do I say this? Uh, I'm my emotional IQ is not as high as other people's. Um, I spent a very good portion of my life without having access to certain emotions at all um, because of uh, being in the closet. Um, after I came out, all those emotions, you know, started coming to the forefront. So, uh, and I've been working through it, you know, with Courtney and, you know, we've you know, done a lot of reading and tried to talk and it's a very common thing. You know, when you live separate lives for decades, um, then everything comes together. You, you kind of can feel everything. And it makes my recovery better from bad situations. Like it makes like it makes my, you know, it makes me a better player. It makes me a better person, that's for sure. But talking about my problems without a solution, if I do that, I'm usually alone. Uh like I'm talking to myself and I'm doing it just to try and figure it out. And the thing of it is, there's nothing to figure out here. I'm not playing too high. I'm not playing too, you know, I'm not playing incorrectly. I'm making all the right decisions uh, from a strong GTO base and an adjustment strategy. So I'm doing everything right, but it takes time. And the thing that's bothering me is that I'm trying to remember that it takes time and that's the thing I can't control. It's like dieting, right? Or do you not mind at all that she has a boyfriend? No, I don't. Actually, I like the guy. He's really cool. Uh, he's a great guy. Um, and, you know, it's it's cool for her. And plus, I've found that it's, it's nice because she goes to uh, his place on su Sundays. This week she went yesterday uh, because there was a wedding and... It was a wedding with a bunch of people that I don't really like. Um, I just grew up around people like this, and, and they just really bother me. Plus, I have to work. I, I have to work so much right now. I really couldn't take time off to go see somebody's wedding that I'm, I'm not close to this person at all. And Courtney's not too close to him, but she wanted to go. She just wanted to get dressed up. It was an excuse to do that. And she was able to take her boyfriend. And they had a great time. She told me all about it on the phone. You know, she's texting me. Uh, you know, they had a wonderful time, but it was totally not my scene with a bunch of strangers. And I, I had no, and not only that, I'd have to like find clothes and like a, a outfit and all this. That. No, 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 no. I couldn't do it, man. So I, I was super happy that she was able to have that experience and I didn't have to fucking be there because it enriches her life without detracting from mine. One thing I see in relationships a lot is like somebody wants to do something and the other person absolutely fucking hates it and they suffer through it for the other person, which is cool to a certain extent, but things like dancing, right? Like I don't dance. I just, I can't do it. I've never been able to do it. It's not that I have the inability, inability physically. I can't emotionally do it. I can't go out onto a dance floor and do that. Um, I danced the horror at my own wedding. That was it. Uh, I danced with my mother, a slow dance, you know, after I got married. And then danced with Courtney, the one dance. 
But that's fucking it, man. And I just did that for... That was the concession that I made. Um, but I'm not going to go fucking dancing because to me it is absolutely insufferable. I can't do it, right? It, it, it's it, I feel too much attention on me, way too self-conscious, especially at this weight. Can't do it. Courtney likes to go dancing sometimes. Uh, so she goes dancing. And she'll go dancing with her girlfriends or, you know, uh, she'll take Michael. And that's cool. And they, you know, she sends me videos and they're having a great time and it's whatever. Uh, what happens if the other guy wants more of a commitment? Uh, it depends on how you define that. Um, they're in love. Like, me and Courtney are in love and them, them two are in love. It's very hard to explain if you've never been in that scenario. Uh, but it's a different kind of love. It's not lesser. It's just different. Um, like if something happened and Michael needed help right now, we would, you know, come together as a family and I'd be involved in it too. I'd be like, dude, what do, what do we need? You know, like whatever. Like it's a very different way to live. I don't recommend it for, for a lot of people because you really can't have jealousy. Um, and it takes a, a large portion of narcissism to pull it off. You have to love yourself enough to not want to miss out on things and understand that the basic thing we tell people is that like I can't be a six foot brother with dreadlocks you know and she can't be you know uh, a 90 pound Filipino femboy you know what I'm saying so it's like why would we take these 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 experiences away from each other really respect how yeah, you manage and it seems to be working for you yeah it, it does it definitely works for us now don't get me wrong you're seeing uh years into the process there there were there were times when it was rough uh mostly for her because i didn't have access to those you know to jealousy i still really don't uh i don't get jealous i get envious uh where i see somebody has something or does something and i i wish i could do that but i don't get jealous if somebody that's a completely different thing like i don't get mad because somebody has something that i want you know what I mean? It's a very distinct line. Uh, I'm not saying I'm I'm evolved or whatever. I'm definitely not as evolved emotionally as other people, but it doesn't bother me. And you know, you get to have a for us, we get to have a fuller life. Um, you know, I mean, I've said it a couple times. I broke up with my uh, girlfriend that I was with for about four years, uh, only about a month and a half ago, and um, there's still some chatter going on, but. It's, I, I think it's over. Um, and it's sad. And, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with that heartbreak. But at the same time, I wouldn't take away the experience for anything. You know, she was an amazing person and she just changed. And uh, I was able to walk away from it. And, you know, there's some things that might happen that could put us back together. But I, realistically, it's not going to happen. And going through that, like now that Courtney has had the feeling of love again, did I get with that girl not long after Canada? Uh, I'd actually, yeah, because uh, that was, I met her while I was driving Uber. Um, yeah, that was after I got back from uh, Canada and I had to start driving Uber uh, because we, uh, uh, you know, we had had the fire before that. We never got any insurance payout that we were supposed to get. And, uh, you know, I needed money. So, yeah, I, I met her yeah, when I started driving Uber. And, uh, yeah, that's when we started seeing each other. Yeah, so, yeah, it was, yeah, it was right, right after Canada. That would have been true because, uh, yeah, it would have been four years. Uh, well, it was four years in September. And we broke up, like, right before that. Hmm. But here's the thing, you know, it was part of my other life. You know, she was a trans girl, uh, you know, that I met on Grinder. So Courtney didn't meet her until after I came out in February uh, of 2020, you know, right before lockdown, which, woo, that made working on the relationship very intense. Um, but she eventually did meet her and, you know, she would do her nails and we would all go to dinner together. And uh, it was a great time. And I, 
you know, I met both, I met, you know, uh, her family and, you know, when they would come over and it was a very different experience and, uh, really wonderful. And, uh, you know, then it ended. That's all you can say. But what are you going to do? But, you know, I mean, I think our kind of thing works best for us because we met on a hookup site. You know what I'm saying? Me and Courtney, you know, we've been together. Uh, well, shit, we've been married like, well, we've been married five years. So we've been together like nine years or something like that. Yeah, we've been together like nine years and um, married, I think, what are we married, six now? I don't know. I always get the numbers messed up. That's part of the dyslexia. But uh, either way, uh, yeah, I think we've been married six years. I know we've been together nine. And, uh, you know, through all that, it's been all this development and everything else. Yeah, it's a long time. And it's like other relationships don't take away from where you're at now. You know, they just, they really don't. Uh, I know it's very hard to understand I, I knew my whole life that trying to be with one person would be ridiculous. So your brain goes, well, guess I'm never getting married. You know what I'm saying? And you just kind of, you, just, you know, that's the end of that. Um, but the truth is there's other ways, you know. Um, you know, and it is what it is. But, uh, you know, I'm still have my experiences. And I'm just kind of, I'm kind of mourning for that relationship. But it's not slowing me down. I mean, there's a... a a lovely uh, uh, Japanese Filipino boy that I've been seeing. That uh, I say boy, he's thirty five, but uh, that's that's just kind of the vernacular. Um, and he seems lovely. You know, we we might end up being something more, but until then, we're just having fun. You know, and it's just nice to have that freedom to to do that. You know, and uh, Courtney was you know she went last night for the the wedding. And uh, she stayed over Michael's because they got, you know, they got fucking blitz. There was actually a, a weed bar at the place because the guy grows his own pot, uh, the guy who got married. So there was actually a weed bar, and uh, it's pretty fucking crazy. <laughs> so they got pretty fucked up and ended up going, you know, and staying over Michael's. And then she usually stays over there on Sundays, which is perfect because I work, uh, you know, all day Sunday. Like, I'm usually either on the grind or editing or studying or whatever, so... I'm, I'm in the house, but you might as well not even fucking be here because, and, and me and Courtney had to have this conversation when, you know, even back when I was playing poker, even before Canada, you know, when I was paying most of the bills playing poker, I had to tell her, I'm like, look, there, there's just some days that when I'm here, you have to act like I'm not here. Like we actually thought about renting me an office off away from the house that I could set up at. Uh, you know, just like a cheap little apartment downtown or something because it was too distracting and she felt neglected because I was here, but I had to be focused. So, you know, for five minutes, every hour I would get up, get more water, grab some food, come back and then continue doing what I was doing. But there was no time for anything else. And it's kind of depressing when you want to spend time with someone and they're here, but you can't spend time with them. You know what I'm saying? It can, it can kind of feel more alone is what she made me understand. Um, so it works out great for me, man. Uh, you know, when she gets to stay one night out and, and in that time I, you know, I, last night I almost had somebody over because, uh, but they had, uh, they couldn't come over, but you know, we were very, we're not, we're not precious with our relationship. You know, uh, we understand it's already been through enough that, you know, some pretty person is not going to break us up. You know, and my attitude is because she asked me once, well, what happens if I, you know, uh, whatever, have these feelings? Because she was afraid to have feelings of love for somebody else because she didn't understand how loves can be different, you know. And, uh, and I said, look, if you fall in love with somebody who treats you better than me and loves you more than me and you love more than me, I would encourage you to leave me for him. But I guarantee you're never going to fucking find it. And that's the thing, too. It kind of keeps you on your toes and appreciating the person you're with. You know what I'm saying? Because here's the thing. Uh, it's pretty easy to not have anybody steal your car if you got a car you don't treat well and you've had for a long time. 
But if you treat that car great, and you know it's a it's a nice car that everybody wants, you know you got to put the club on it. You got to have an alarm. You got to pay it attention. You got to park it in a safe place. You got to take care of it. You know what I'm saying? And if nobody wants to fuck your woman, uh, then you don't have a good woman. Sorry, that's just a fact of life. So other people should want to fuck your woman. If you're okay with them fucking your woman, that's one thing. But if you're not, you're going to have to have that conversation. But jealousy is a waste of fucking time. Like if, if somebody thinks, if you think I can, if you think somebody else can love you better, go ahead. Cause all I want is your happiness. That's, that's the end of the, that's the end of the story. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't bat an eye if Courtney came back to me and said, look, I want to go ahead and leave and move in with Michael. Okay. Knock your ass out. Uh, it's going to be a mistake and I wouldn't take you back. <laughs> because I know the real deal, you know, but she knows. And uh, it's funny because once I put it that way, she allowed herself to have those feelings and emotions and uh, her relationship with him's gotten much deeper and our relationship's gotten deeper because she understands what I was going through with my girl, uh, which is not worse, not better, just a different form of love, uh, but still very deep. So hope that answers all those questions. Just kind of got into talking about myself because I'm kind of uh, bummed on poker, I guess. But do appreciate you guys hanging out and listening. Let's try to get through one of these sections, man. Do a little work here. Now let's discuss the situation. Oh, that's loud. You're facing a pre-flop raise and a call before the action gets to you. As in all scenarios, you want to be considering your opponent's tendencies, but as the pot becomes more and more multi-way, usually the player you're most concerned with is the person who RFI'd, the person who raised the first in. So the initial raiser is the player you want to be the most concerned with because they are going to have all of the best hands in their raising range, because everyone raises with the best hands for the most part, plus some amount of additional hands. And uh, for example, if your opponent is a tight aggressive player, a tag, they're going to have the best hands, plus a few slightly weaker hands. But if your opponent is a tight passive player, when they raise, they're usually going to have only... Yeah, I got the yearly package from Jonathan Little. Uh, I've had the premium membership for over a year and a half now. I think I renew in June. Uh, yeah, I locked in my price. It's pretty good. It's definitely an investment, but uh, it's paid for itself. I mean, I, I know that it's paid for itself easily 20 times over. In that time it's crazy and that doesn't mean I've won 20 times as much as I paid that means I know I've won 20 times more than I would have won if I didn't have it so I'm talking about my regular winning level and then 20 times what I paid for that subscription I know I've added to it it's fucking insane it's probably more than that the best hands a tight passive player is referred to as a knit by the way if your opponent is loose and aggressive a lag they are going to have the best hands plus a lot of marginal hands. And if your opponent is loose and passive, well, their strategy is going to be all over the place because some loose and passive players only raise the absolute best hands, but some do raise a little bit wider. So you always want to be making sure that you're paying attention to their strategy and adjusting accordingly. Personally, I think it's good if you want to remember these player types. In game, once you've marked somebody as a tight aggressive player or a knit or whatever, uh, I like to give them a character in my head. Uh, so what character says those things to me? So like, uh, you know, a, a tight aggressive player, you know, in, in Star Wars, you know, or what would a nit be in Star Wars? That'd be like C-3PO, you know, very averse to risk, you know, uh, things like that. You know, loose passive, you know, uh, I don't know, fucking uh, uh, Lando, pretty much loose passive, you know. Uh, loose aggressive, uh, Boba Fett, very, very uh, uh, opportunistic and aggressive, you know. Who's the tight aggressive player in uh, Star Wars? Is it Luke Skywalker? It might be. Wow. Yeah, the tight aggressive player might be Luke Skywalker in uh, Star Wars. But that's what I do when I'm trying to classify different players is I come up with a character that I feel like represents that type that I'm trying to envision. Then it's just easier to see them as this in your head and it kind of reinforces this thing. And not for nothing, it makes poker a little bit more fun. So just a little something I do, just so you know.
A very important point, though, is that when there is a razor and then a... Usually that's only done live. Online, I go by a lot more numbers and just using regular tag, knit, lag, calling station, shit like that. Call. The caller is almost always capped, meaning they do not have the best hands in their range because if they did have pocket aces, kings, queens, jacks, ace, king, etc., they would have three bets. So you know that the caller probably doesn't have the best hands, which means the player who has the best hands is the initial raiser. So the question is what proportion of premium hands is in their range because if it's a lot of premium hands, that's going to lead you to play differently than if it's relatively few. Small side note, what he says about the caller having a capped range, there are instances that I've played in where I've been the caller, had the capped range, and know that the small blind is doing something crazy. So like, imagine this scenario. It's an eight-handed table or nine-handed, whatever. The guy under the gun plus one opens. I'm in the cutoff with pocket nines, right? And I have 30 blinds. I don't want to three bet because I don't want to play against that opener for the whole stack, right? So this is a very common scenario where I'll call. Then it gets to the, the button, the small blind or big blind, and they three bet, right? Their range, while it should be tighter, for the most part is looser than the other player because they're putting on a squeeze. So in this scenario, you're going to see a player with 20 blinds in the small blind jam quite a bit and then the the guy who raised under the gun plus two because i'm in the pot behind him and he doesn't know what i'm doing he now has to fold and he has to fold hands as strong as tens and jacks so when it comes back to me i can then call comfortably playing against this range and that's a scenario that i get into quite often and if it's a scenario where i'd like to race this hand but versus a weaker range than under the gun plus two I will just call it, get jammed on by the button, small blind, or big blind, and snap call it. Because that's the race I want. I don't want to race against the guy who's raising into seven players. I want to race the guy who's squeezing after not, you know 60, six of the nine players have folded. That's the race I want. Because he's more likely to have smaller pairs than nines. You know, you can do that with sevens, eights, sixes, fine. You know, some players even do it with fives, believe it or not. And he's also going to have all the big card hands that aren't great, like king-queen, uh, king-jack suited. He's going to have ace-jack offsuit. And when this player folds, it actually has some removal. Hands like ace-jack, ace-queen, king-queen are going to fold in that scenario. So now this guy even has less outs against me if it is a race. So small thing that I, I noticed and put together about a year ago uh, and it's become a very profitable situation for me. So understanding your position at the table, even when your range is capped, sometimes you're going to end up racing the hand that you w didn't want to three bet preflop. Premium hands. So let's go through the common player types and how you should generally adjust against them. Against an initial raiser who is a tight, aggressive player, you're just going to want to play. So this is somebody who opened the pot and you're considering three betting. Okay, that's what we're talking about. Play fundamentally sound poker and just... But they are a, you know, a, a, a snug player. You know what I'm saying? Tight aggressive, meaning they're going to play only the best hands, they're going to play them aggressively, and they're not going to get out of line with bad hands. You know, like meaning, you know, unsuited connectors and things. Generally follow the 75 big blind charts we've already outlined. You are going to want to fold call three bet for value and as a bluff which is the normal frequencies you're not going to want to do anything too fancy because in general tight aggressive poker is good poker now some people take uh, the term tight to mean like super super tight to the point that you become a nit i'm not saying people who only raise aces kings and queens are good players what i'm saying is you know good fundamentally sound players force you to in turn play good fundamentally sound poker in this instance tight aggressive is basically GTO because it means that you are raising considering your cards before your position. So I'll be more tight aggressive in early stages of the tournament or when I'm super stacked up, you know, in the middle, you know, having 60 plus blinds, that's more of a time to be tight aggressive. Meaning in the earlier positions, I'm not playing the hands like King Queen offsuit, uh, you know, uh, 10 Jack offsuit, things like that. 
I'm waiting till the later positions as those charts would dictate. So because your stack is so big, it is more valuable. You know what I'm saying? It's not a time to just piss chips away or whatever. Now, if you're 30 big blinds, you're going to play those hands because you're going to want to get the money in with top pair. You know what I'm saying? If you have king, queen, and you raise, and somebody calls you, uh, you know, from the button, and you flop a king, you're probably going to be happy getting it in. You know what I'm saying? Uh, most of the time, depending on what the rest of the board texture is. You can have some draws or stuff like that, but, you know, you're going to get three bet by ace, queen, and ace, king. So when you make top pair king, you're probably good, you know, uh, unless, you know, they flop a set on you, which is going to happen very rarely. So it's just a concept to understand that usually tight aggressive follows those GTO charts. Against a knit, a tight passive player, you're going to want to fold the big cards that are often dominated. So if someone raises and someone calls, and you know the initial raiser is very tight, in this scenario, hands like king-jack offsuit are going to be dominated. So that hand just needs to fold. You're gonna to want to call with hands that have implied odds. These are gonna be suited connectors, suited aces, small and medium pairs these hands flop very well so against these players who are likely to have a strong hand you don't want to three bet them because they're just going to four bet you which would be terrible because then you have to fold uh, you just want to call and see a cheap flop and you want to be three betting these players way less often than you normally would and if you are going to three bet them you're going to find that the best bluffs are usually just the big blocker cards that's going to be stuff like ace jack offsuit king queen offsuit because these hands don't play post-flop as well as you may think they do when you're against a range that contains a whole lot of premium hands plus perhaps a few um, you know, slightly weaker hands that'll fold out to a three bet. So you're going to find the big offsuit cards are probably the best hands to three bet bluff against the tight passive player. You shouldn't hate nits uh, there, lulls. Um, nits are probably the easiest players to beat uh, because there's two factors about nits. One, they don't play a lot of hands. You know what I'm saying? So the hands that they are playing are very strong. But when somebody doesn't play a lot of hands and then they raise and you have a hand with implied odds like a small or medium pair or suited connector, well, then you could just flop against them. And the funny thing about nits that you got to remember is they play so few hands that they are going to make damn sure they don't get bluffed off of it. Like you would think somebody who plays so tightly would fold aces very easily on a bad flop for them, but you would be fucking gobsmacked to see the amount of times some some nit, and this happens a lot in live poker, but online too. It's usually a cash game thing. It happens in tournaments though, but you'd be amazed how many times I've seen a nit open who has 100 blinds, right? I'm on the button and I have something, you know, worth calling, a pair, like, you know, pair of, you know, sixes or something. And we go to the flop three ways, big blind calls. Flop comes off, you know, six five four, which is great. I probably have the best hand, but I'm vulnerable. Checks to the knit. They see bet big. Like if they made a raise, let's just use a live example that I'm actually thinking of. If they open to six bucks and now that, you know, I've called it and the big blind called it, so there's 19 in the middle because of the small blind folded, right? They'll bet 15 bucks at that flop of 654. This is an exact hand I'm thinking of. And it came to me on the button, and the guy bet 15, and there's, you know, 19 in the pot. So I just went, I'll make it 100. And I just made it 50 blinds, right? I went from his 7.5 blind bet to 50. Then it goes back, and the big blind folds, goes back to this dude. I'm all in. I call. You have aces? That Literally, that's the way it happened. And I rolled it over. And the guy had aces, didn't even have backdoor flush draw. And he was, and he just started cursing me out. This happened like four months ago uh, when I was playing at South Point. And he was like, how the fuck do you get so lucky in this, that, and the other? And I go, I don't know, man. Charmed life, I guess. Uh, really lucky, though. And he goes, and he even told me, he's like, how fucking stupid is it that you raised that flop? And I'm like, yeah, I don't know, man. I just, uh, I didn't want to get drawn out on. I used his vernacular. Like, he was like, what could you get drawn out by? And I was like, well, you could have a seven, even though that's a ridiculous thing to say because this fucking nit does not open pocket sevens. He's folding pocket sevens in the first four spots on the table. Under the gun to the low jack, he's folding sevens. And he's never raising it. He's limping it, if anything. So the guy ended up being my buddy, and I ended up cleaning him out like three times over the course of like a month. Uh, it was really crazy because he just doesn't get it. And that's the thing you got to remember about nits. 
they don't want to get bluffed. They want to get bluffed less than anybody. You know what I'm saying? They, they believe they're entitled to win the pot when they were so patient to wait for their fucking aces. You're not. On stars, the zoom pools, you'll see people play deuce deuce or four deuce deuce and eight deuce, ace, eight four deuce. Yeah, I mean, zoom is kind of a different animal because I think everybody plays tighter on zoom because it is so fast. Um, I was actually thinking about playing some zoom on stream. Uh, they have it on ACR. It's called Rush Poker, I think. Is it called Rush or Zoom? Uh, Blitz. It's called Blitz on uh, ACR. There's a bunch of different versions. Basically the same thing. You fold and it just whoosh, another table comes in and you're immediately playing the next hand. Uh, I kind of wanted to play it because I've found I've had great success in it uh, by just tightening my range slightly. So you're at a six-handed table. Under the gun is the low jack. You just play like you're in under the gun plus two. Just a little tighter. Add, act like it's a seven-handed table, not a six-handed table. Because everybody else is playing so god-awful tight that they won't play the correct percentage of hands, so your implied odds hands go through the roof. So you can basically play that shit by just never raising, uh, unless you have like aces or kings exactly, or ace-king, uh, and just calling with all the hands you want to play from every position. So all suited connectors, uh, all pairs, you know, all suited aces, uh, basically anything suited and good, and pairs. And you pretty much don't want to three bet anything less. If you're playing 10 NL, or I'd say if you're playing probably 50 NL uh, zoom or lower, you don't want to three bet anything uh, less than ace king, and that includes queens. You want to take a flop with queens, get good value uh, versus somebody when they have ace jack and they hit a jack on the flops, you know, situations like that. And yeah, you're going to have to fold a lot of queens on the turn and shit like that, but you know what? Uh, you're trying to win buy-ins. You're not trying to win these, you know, 20, 30 big blind pots. You're trying to win 100 big blind, you know, 200 big blind pots where you double up. And uh, my best tip for Zoom, you double up, Get off the fucking table, close it, and reopen another one with a fresh stack. Don't sit there with 300 fucking blinds in front of you in a format where most people are going to only have 100 blinds. It's pointless. All you're going to do is open yourself up to almost to accidentally playing a 200 big blind pot. You know what I'm saying? That's going to be the problem. They've got a first flight for next week's double deuce in about an hour. I might actually play this fucking thing. I, I really want to play that tournament. And uh, th this thing's going to be low whatever. Yeah, I rat hole. I have stars capped. Auto sit me out at above 180 big blinds. Very strong. Yeah. I like that. The auto sit out. They don't have that on ACR. That's a good feature. Yeah. Super strong to rat hole there. And here's the thing. People talk about rat holing like it's negative. Now, granted, if you're playing live, there's some merit to not, you know, to staying there. But I've done it live where, you know, you start out with $300, you know, on a one, two. And, you know, then you get up to like seven or 800 bucks in like an hour and a half. And I'm just like, uh, I'm going to go have lunch and I'll just pick up my fucking chips. And I've had players sit there and say, oh, you can leave your chips. I'm like, ah. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to eat. I don't. I might not even come back. I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of really tired. And then I'll go pick my chips up, make sure I wait the full half hour so I can't just rebuy in for it. And, you know, I'll color it up, you know, to hundreds, and then go eat, and then come back. And if the same slot's open, I'll go, hey, guys, and I'll go back and sit back down at the table, and uh, I'll look at the dealer, and I'll be like, oh, I guess I can only buy in for the, the max, right? Or they'll tell me, they're like, yeah, the max is 300 would be sweet to see you get in the 100k. I agree. And here's the thing, like, multi-day tournaments online are great because of their payout, but you have to know how to attack getting through day one. And I think I kind of forgot that because I should be trying to get into that tournament on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays like a motherfucker. I should be playing most of those flights until I get into one. Because the idea is to have a workable stack, which for me, uh, the blinds are gonna, you're going to come into on day two are 12,5, 25,000 with a 2,500 ante. I want a million. 
Uh, that's 40 blinds. That's all it is. And it's very feasible. It's very doable. You say, well, that's 10xing your stack. It is. But, you know, because you get 100,000 chips when you sit down in the flight. But here's the thing. As the tournament goes on, right, you're going to see normal progression. You're going to be at, you know, 200,000 and then 400,000. You're going to be at 500,000. And right about when you get to, like, the normal progression of 5x your stack, which is, like, I don't know, seven or eight levels in, right, very standard, you're going to have players who are re-entering now with 20 blinds, and you have 50. There's a lot of great race situations in there for you where you can race ace-queen. And you're going to have to get lucky, yeah, but you're trying to build a stack. It really is a great format for that. Um, and to be perfectly honest, i got to give myself some credit. I had big stacks going, but not good enough stacks to sit out, right? Every time I took the beat over these past six uh, that I played, or seven, whatever it was, I had stacks around 750,000 or more. At one point, I had a million, and we still had two levels to go. If I, if I don't do anything there and I just knit up, I'm going to go into the second day with like 650,000, maybe 700,000. It's not enough. It's not enough. I want to have a chance at winning the tournament. So I didn't play loose, but I didn't shy away from the races. And you know what? I had a race with pocket tens versus ace queen for 20 blinds, and I lost it. Okay, fine. I've got 800,000 now. You know what I'm saying? And it just kind of went that way. Took another race with Ace King versus a guy's Jacks and lost it. Well, now I have six hundred thousand. You know what I'm saying? And it just kind of, I just kind of lost a bunch of races in a row. If I had won one of the three races, I would have been right back to my million, and I could have ended the day, you know, within ten minutes of the one I played last night with a million chips, and I'd be playing the hundred K today. You know, so it's a great format, and uh, I think I need to play them to get in it because uh, it would be a very valuable tournament to get in. Uh, just because if you start out with 40 blinds, you're going to be well ahead of the field. Could definitely pull a grand in that pretty easily. Like, I'm going to go ahead and look at it now. Here, the double deuce main. Check this out. This is the tournament I was trying to get into. This thing starts in an hour and 15 minutes, right? This is a $20 buy-in tournament to get through the flight. There are 1,174 players. Everybody's pretty much in the cash. When the last flight ends, everybody will be in the cash. I don't think it's over just yet. It'll be over in about 15 or 20 minutes. So everybody here is going to be in the cash, right? So you're already going to make like double your buy-in, right? Uh, but look at top prize. 40 grand. Because the thing got a quarter million. They called it 100 guaranteed. It got a quarter million because of all the flights. And if you come into this thing with a million, which is where I want it to be... Do, 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 do. You're in 423rd out of 1174 players. You're starting a tournament with basically three times the average. It's crazy. Ugh. And to get, you know, a thousand bucks, you only got to come in 15th. Give me this chip stack. Tell me I can't get 15th. Like, it's going to take some bad, bad beats. Uh, and even after all my entries, uh, which I paid for five of them, I think. Yeah, I spun in twice. It's 110 bucks. All I got to do is last to 234 to get my money back. So it's pretty good. And uh, in all honesty, making this final table of eight for three grand, awesome. But dude, the top three spots, 40 grand. If I won 40 grand, that basically covers my bills for the next 10 months. I would probably sit there and take 10 grand, put it in a solid bankroll, move up slightly, and then 30 grand would be for bankroll for the next, or would be for life roll for the next seven to eight months. I wouldn't even have to worry about playing. You know what I'm saying? That's the difference is having that padding. The only times I've ever considered myself a professional poker player is when I had months upon months of expenses already in the bank. So I didn't even have to think about it. I would make my withdrawals once a month. I would make my withdrawals on like the 14th of the month. Other than that, I wouldn't even look at the fucking balance because I knew I didn't need to. Is there still time to get in? Nope. I played the last uh, flight right before I started this stream. What are you going to do? Um, but I'm definitely going to take it more seriously, especially now 
like this thing's coming back at in at level 19 right which is 25,000 then it goes to 30 35 40 50 you don't get to a hundred thousand for seven levels those are 15 minute levels that's two hours so with a million chips in two hours at this blind level all you got to do is get to like four million to have the same amount as I started the tournament at 40 blinds but I could easily see getting to three million very easily so it's a great tournament I mean it really is a great format and I'm definitely gonna try to get my ass into it they're using the same format for the Sunday million uh, flights all week and then the main event on Sunday it's pretty awesome yeah but they even have satellites into the satellite these are fun I'm gonna start playing these the uh, all inner fold for a dollar thirty or a dollar forty right you're playing for twenty two dollar tickets and uh, these are all inner fold so you either put all your money in or you fold the hand and uh, these are great satellites because they don't take much emotional or financial investment you know what I'm saying you say only one in 20 players gets the seat yeah but you don't have to make bad decisions you just sit there and go oh I have Kings and you just jam the money in. you know what I'm saying or or ace king or whatever like there's no real it's just a gto training course so those are great but yeah I, i'm bummed but next week i'll get in it i just i have to it's just too valuable okay let's go against loose uh, aggressive range or loose ranges here let's keep going players assuming you want to have bluffs in your range at all to begin with which you know maybe you don't against a loose aggressive player you're going to want to fold less often which essentially means you're going to expand your overall range so if you look at the standard default 75 big blind charts let's say someone raises and you're on the button with queen eight suited it's probably just a fold but if it goes raise call call sorry my series going off over there <laughs> if it goes raise call call before it gets to you now hands like queen eight suited become like kind of marginal to consider playing it's not going to be a great hand, but it's at least a consideration. Um, that said, the big offsuit cards against loose ranges actually go way up in value. And that's because they are going to dominate the initial raiser, and they're going to be in pretty good shape against the caller. Whereas if you 3-bet them, turning them into a bluff essentially, and get 4-bet, you then have to fold. So you're going to find that you typically want to be calling with more of the big card hands. And I think you should also be bluffing a little bit more often with a polarized range. I have ace-10 offsuit listed here, but I think hands like ace-9 offsuit, ace-x suited, um, stuff like queen-jack offsuit, I think those are all reasonable hands to consider 3-bet bluffing with. Basically, 3-bet bluffing against a loose uh, player, uh, especially a loose aggressive player. 3-bet bluffing, you just want to have hands that have removal. So an ace in your hand is great. Uh, big cards are great. Uh, tens are awesome. Uh, nines are good too because of the straight card removals. So hands like, uh, you know, uh, what is it like queen nine and king nine? Uh, those hands are going to raise, but when you have a nine in your hand, you have removal, so they're not going to have as many of those. So uh, it makes it less likely that the player is going to be on a similar straight draw if you flop it. Just interesting removal hands that you're basically looking to three bet, and if you get four bet, you fold it. But if you get called, well, now you're in position against a player who's going to flop way too wide, and you can just see bet and take it down a ton. So that's the concept against loose, aggressive players. Like, you'll see me at the table sometimes. I'll even say, dude, if this guy raises again, uh, I'm going to raise him with one good card. And that's because I only need a little bit. Like, you don't want to do it with, like, seven deuce. You don't want to be totally flying blind. But if you have, like, queen nine or, you know, ace five, even offsuit, all those cards, it's good enough. It's good enough because you've removed certain pieces of what they can have by having them in your hand. Ace-10 sort of on the cusp, which is why I have it here and want to discuss it, because with Ace-10 offsuits, it, it sort of fits into the big offsuit cards, but also it's like kind of marginal when it comes to calling. So hands like that you can consider bluffing or three-betting, depending on the strategy of the loose aggressive player. Of all of these four player types, you're going to find there's usually the most... Um, variance within that player type based on the loose or of, of the on the loose aggressive players because the loose aggressive players could be maniacal right they could just be four betting you every single time you three bet or they could raise a lot pre-flop but then play very passively when they get three bets i think you're going to find most loose aggressive players 
recognize they win money because people fold too often. So when they raise and you three bet them, they're usually going to think, okay, guy has a good hand and I'm going to fold. And if that's the case, you want to be three betting a lot as a bluff. But if they're just going to four bet you every time, then you want to be three betting wider for value. So your default strategy against a loose aggressive player needs to be a little bit more defined by the actual tendencies of your specific opponent. Um, next, against the calling stations, the loose passive players, you want to, again, expand your range, assuming they're raising with still a generally wide range, because if they're only raising with the, not, the absolute best hands, that's going to alter your strategy a bit. Um, you typically want to, again, three bet the unsuited big cards that are often ahead, because these players are going to call your three bet very wide. If someone's going to raise a hand like king eight offsuit and then call a three bet with it, well, then king jack offsuit becomes just a straight value three bet which is the same thing with um, a strong linear range with hands like ace-10 of diamonds. They're just hands that flop pretty well. So with the hands that tend to dominate your opponent's loose range, you usually just want to build the pot. And if you do three bet a hand like king-jack offsuit or ace-10 suited, and then a loose but passive player four bets you, you should usually fold because they're probably not doing a whole lot of four betting a bluff. In general, you want to be using decently large pot-sized bets in all of these scenarios. So... Um, Usually you're going to make it about three times whatever the last bet is, plus any additional money in the pot. So if there's a raise to three big blinds and a call, you make it three times the last bet, which was the three big blind caller. So that would be nine, plus any additional money in the pot, which would be the three flop raise to three big blinds, the small blind, the big blind, and the ante. So that'd be something like 13-ish big blinds if we are raising over a three big blind. Now there's a thing to remember here. If you make it a rule in your head that you're using pot-sized bets for three bets, it will help you define what to do and when. So let's say a tight aggressive player opens in first position and you have ace-queen uh, offsuit on the button. You know he's a tight aggressive player. If your only option uh, for raising is to make it a full pot size bet, you probably don't want to do that because that's going to reduce the stack to pot ratio too far. Then again, if the player is a loose aggressive player you're going to want a three bet you're going to sit there and be on the button with hands like king jack offsuit or you know uh you know ace nine or ace eight you know suited things like that you're going to sit there and go this player plays too many hands i'm going to make a, a pot size bet so he'll fold so by understanding that there's no variance in your pre-flop raises like when you open you're going to open the same amount with aces as you are with fucking, you know, uh, deuces. You know, if you're in that position and you're opening, this is your open based on your stack and the stage of the tournament. That's it. That's all. You don't raise two big blinds when you have aces and make it three big blinds when you have deuces because the hand is weaker. You're giving up too much information, right? We all understand that. Same deal with three betting. You're always going to three bet the same pot size bet or more. If you're out of position, you're going to want to raise even more than a pot size bet because the point you're trying to make has to be easy to understand. You don't want to get too complicated in your thinking. You don't want to sit there, and there are players who will re-raise smaller with their better hands. So if you open an early position and see a three bet from a fairly standard player with numbers like, you know, 18, 18, 10, you know, things like that, if they three bet you, normally your hands are normal. Your hands can play normally. But if they three bet you small, like if you make it two big blinds and then instead of them making it six or seven, they make it five on the button, yeah, this might be a very interesting scenario where you can just open fold queens. Uh, you know, or you can just open and then fold to the three bet with queens because the player is changing the size of their raise based on the strength of their hand. Do I advise it? Depends on how many chips you have. Maybe you call and play the queens to set mine. You know, that's usually a great thing to do in that scenario. But don't change your raises based on your hand strength. Uh, there are some small situations when you're deep, deep in a tournament uh, and everybody's got about 20 blinds and you're trying to get all the money in, then yeah. Uh, but even then, I'll just maybe, I'll make it look like a misclick. Like just min re-raise it and then like get jammed on by the original opener because they think I misclicked it. But other than that, you're pretty much going to stay with a pot size bet, and it solidifies your thinking of what you're trying to accomplish in the hand before you make a mistake. Raise. All right, let's take a look at this graph I have for all of you. 
this is sort of a way to think about how to adjust to various player types. So we have on the left hand, the up and down axis, that is their VPIP, their voluntarily put dollars in pot. This is a term that comes from online poker where it essentially tells you what percentage of hands your opponent is voluntarily playing. It doesn't count when they are um, necessarily like in the big blind to get to check, right? So in this scenario, you're going to find that people have a V, a VPIP, of about 10 are very tight. If they're only playing 10% of their hands, they're pretty tight. If they're playing 30% of their hands or more, they are pretty loose. So there's a spectrum here, right, between 10 and 30. On the bottom axis, we have the preflop raise percentage. And that's going to range usually somewhere between like 10 and 25. I'm sorry, between 5 and 25. Um, 5 is pretty tight. 25 is pretty loose. So if you are playing online and you have what's referred to as a heads-up display, it's a program that displays stats about your opponents directly on the screen that you're playing, and you see someone who's playing um, 10 slash 5, meaning 10 VPIP, 5 preflop raise, that player is going to be really tight. And you just don't want to bluff that player off very much at all and you want to be calling with way more implied odds hands like small pairs suited connectors etc if your opponent is raising very little but playing a lot of hands then in that scenario you can often three bet them a little bit wider for value just with a straight linear range when you are going to be three betting them against a tight aggressive player who's you know pretty tight when it comes to raising perhaps also pretty tight um, when it comes to playing pots in general against a player like this you're going to find that you just want to stay balanced and then against a loose aggressive player who's playing lots of pots and playing them aggressively you usually want to be bluffing more although again the way you respond to your specific loose aggressive player will vary because sometimes they're just going to four bet you every time against someone who four bets you every time you should not necessarily be bluffing more you should just be three betting more linearly and then not folding so that's how you're going to want to adjust to the various player types so let's take a look at a few hands real quick that will demonstrate how you should be playing against the various player types. So here we have a raise to 600 and a call. In this situation, let's discuss how we would play depending on how Under the Gun Plus One reacts. If Under the Gun Plus One is just a good, tight, aggressive player, I'm going to want to call with this hand. The big suited cards flop very, very well, and I want to see a flop with it. So against a player like that, I would just call. If I was against a player who was raising a wide range, who would also call my three bets with all sorts of junk, sort of a loose-ish but passive player, I would very likely three bet this. If I'm gonna three bet this, I'm gonna make it three times the last bet, which would be 1,800, plus any additional money in the pot, which was 900. So I'd make it something like 2,700 in this scenario. A loose passive player is a bad player. They're playing too many hands, they're not being aggressive enough. Bad player. So the reason why you're three betting is so that they will call and you will be heads up against them. You get this other player out of the pot. Because when you have the bad player on the table, the spot, you want to be playing against the spot, especially in position. So these hands become much more valuable. So um, that's usually what I'm doing. Against a very tight player, I'm essentially playing this hand by calling as an implied odds hand. If I had any, any student ace, I'd be calling against a loose passive player. So uh, that's usually what I'm doing in this scenario. This time we do just call, and we get to see a flop. And this is a fine result. When you do get to see a flop very multi-way, you're not always going to win the pot. That is okay. Don't think you have to win every single pot, even if you usually start with the best hand. Because you know, we are playing a game where you get to see the board. Let's take a look at this hand here. We have a raise and a call. This is a spot where I'm going to be way more inclined to 3-bet, just in general. The only time I'm not going to 3-bet is if the initial raiser is very, very tight. Because if the initial raiser is very, very tight, they're going to be way more likely to have a hand like ace, king, ace, queen, ace, jack, aces, kings, queens, that is just gonna four bet me. If I did want to have four bet or three bet bluffs against a tight player, though, this is a hand to do it with. In general, I'm usually three betting the big offsuit cards against most people, though. So in this scenario, if I'm gonna three bet, I'm gonna make it three times the last bet plus any additional money in the pot. So that'd be 1,500 plus 500 plus a little bit more. So call it 2,300 or so. Um, we do make a 2,000 here, which I think is perfectly fine and viable. When you are three-bet bluffing, usually the big offsuit cards are quite nice to do it with because they're really not quite good enough to call, but they have really good blockers. So I, I like the idea of three-betting this type of hand and calling with a hand like ace-jack suited, so same hand but suited, because that hand now will just flop better hands more often. 
this time they all fold and you know that's a fine result now let's discuss playing from the big blind specifically in this scenario you're going to be getting a very good price you're going to be getting good pot odds and you are closing the action meaning no one else yet to act can re-raise but those are not actually great reasons to defend your big blind in a multi-way pot because well of many things you're going to realize your equity poorly let's say you do have a hand like king seven offsuit and someone raises and someone calls if you call the big blind and you flop a king or a seven well now we're out of position we could be very dominated by either player and that's just not a good spot to be you should actually be way more inclined to defend the big blind when you're going to be heads up even though you're getting worse pot odds with hands like a big card and a little card that's offsuit because you're less, less likely to be dominated in general so you're going to find that as the pot becomes more and more multi-way post-flop playability becomes very very important so you're going to find that whenever you're playing multi-way the junky offsuit cards like king three or queen seven or jack six these hands just do not want to be played you want to avoid playing hands that make mostly or entirely marginal made hands i realize that you're getting really good pot odds so you can say well i'm only going to continue if i make three of a kind but then if you use that logic you end up playing a little bit too tightly so it's usually best to just avoid the situations immediately when you have a pretty marginal hand because you have big reverse implied odds and you just can't play your hand very very well so whenever you're in the big blind you kind of want to proceed as if you were on the button where you're calling with hands that generally just flop reasonably well so call with implied odds hands and big suited cards like 10-8 suited king queen offsuit i don't know why my siri keeps turning on we should probably turn this off huh <laughs> um you should typically be three bet bluffing the big unsuited cards again so stuff like king jack offsuit ace 10 offsuit hands like that can usually be three bet as a bluff and you often want to be three betting for value with your best hand so you see that's actually kind of a linear range which is to some extent what the big blind was doing against just a single pre-flop razor and i think it's going to be a pretty good strategy i'm not three betting a whole lot of suited connected hands from the big blind at this point anymore because whenever it is multi-way you'll just make straights and flushes some portion of the time and that's usually a pretty good spot to be in let's take a look at two scenarios here where we have a raise a call and a call and another call this is a situation where a lot of people just call every single time and that is a big 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 mistake this hand flops very poorly and if you do make a pair it's usually going to be dominated by someone who has a better kicker or a higher pair so you just want to get out of the way here and fold immediately that may seem a little bit tight to some people but this hand queen seven jack seven all these hands just need to be folded if this was 10 7 i would be inclined to call because at that point you start to be able to make a few straights but this is a hand that you just have to fold let's take a look at this spot here we have eight seven suited facing a raise and a call now i'm going to be very inclined to call even if this was a very multi-way pot i would still call because we're closing the action which you know is is good you'd rather be closing the action than not closing the action and the hand can make lots of straights and flushes and if it does happen to make two pair the you know eight five is usually pretty good like if it comes eight five two you're not going to be in bad shape all that often whereas if you have a hand like king seven and it comes king queen seven well now you could easily be against a hand like king queen right so this is a spot where i'm pretty happy to call with the eight five suited and see a flop it is worth mentioning in the small blind you should play pretty tightly if i had this hand in the small blind with this action i would have just folded so i'm still going to be playing pretty snug from the small blind in this spot even though you have a little bit of money in the pot you have very very poor position post flop and it's just not going to go well for you so far so, so from the small blind you do want to be pretty tight in this position so that's really it when it comes to facing a raise and a call i do think it is very important to consider your opponent's tendencies and then adjust accordingly depending on exactly how they react i realize this chart is not 100 percent perfect by any means but if your opponent is very tight and they don't play very many hands well don't bluff them right if they're playing a lot of hands and you know they're not super tight when it comes to raising but if they're you know playing with some amount of aggression you should be three betting more for value if they are just generally loose and maniacal you probably want to bluff more but maybe that's not true if they're just going to fight fire with fire and four bet every time and if your opponent does just play good fundamentally sound poker you are probably going to just want to stay balanced and follow the charts all right let's do the quiz 
on the gun plus one raises 2.75 75 big blinds out of his 75 big blind stack everyone folds to you in the big blind you have nine six suited huh well uh it only costs you uh three quarters of a blind to call nine six suited flops pretty well we are heads up but he is under the gun plus one hmm uh, cut off called. Okay, I didn't see that part. Cut off called. Um, because of the 9 6 suited, do we raise? I think we can just call here. Um, I think we'd rather have something like King Jack, King 10 to make the squeeze, so I'm going with call. Yeah. Because, you know, we can make a lot of good hands with 9 6 suited. These word problems take me a minute, man. It's just part of my dyslexia. Low jack raises 2.75 out of 75 big blinds. Button calls. Everyone folds two in the big blind with queen four off. Um, I mean, you could three bet it, but it's not great. I think it's honestly just a fold. Yeah. And the big card, little card thing is the thing that fucks people up. King seven, you know, queen four. One big card, one little card. You know, if you had queen ten, sure. Three bet it all day, man. Make the squeeze. But big card, little card, big problem. Uh, under the gun, plus two. 75 big blinds. Cut off calls. You're on the button with ace, queen, suited. See, now that's interesting. Because if it was off suit, I really think I would three bet. But because it's suited, I think I want to call. Because my hand's pretty strong and I'm in position. Yeah, I think I like it. Ah, is it because I guess it's because we're so deep stacked, we should be three betting under the gun plus two. Oh, so wait a minute. Oh, that's the that's the low jack. So the low jack opens, cut off calls. Yeah, you three bet. Sorry. Yeah, it's because the stacks are so big. If I was on like forty blinds, then you could call it. Yeah. I have to nip out. Are you coming back to play later? Yeah, I'm gonna be back around uh, probably about three o'clock. So about an hour and a half, maybe two hours. And uh, I'm going to get on my Sunday grind. I feel I feel better after working through some of this. Uh, the cutoff raise 2.75 out of his 75 big blind stack. And the button calls. All right. You are in the small blind with ace-10 off. I like squeezing here. So, yeah, we're going to go 13 big blinds. Cool, man. I'll see you later, lulz. Cutoff raises 275 out of 75 big blinds. Button calls. You were in the small blind with 10-9 off. Uh, that's a fold. It's just not good enough. Yeah. Too weak. All right. Market is complete. Uh, now let's discuss the scenario. Go back to the courses. I want to make sure that it checked it, marked it as complete. Sometimes it glitches out on me because of the uh, slow processing speed of the site. The only, my only complaint is that the site isn't perfectly uh, updated. So, all right. So, we got that done. Uh, I'm going to go ahead. I got to eat uh, and get ready. Uh, I'm going to come back around 3, 3.30. So, that's about an hour and a half to two hours of my time uh, and play the Sunday grind, man. And, uh, you know, every day is another chance to win a million. So, fuck it. Let's do it. Uh, I'll see you guys later. Have a great day. There's a lot of streamers on, uh, but just come back for me. I'm not going to bother hosting anybody. I'll see you later.